So I had a few people asking about the sermon yesterday. They weren't able to make the church service and we had a glitch with our YouTube channel and uh, with our online stream. And so I thought I'd try something a little different and just kind of give the message again, but maybe in a little bit more informal uh, setting and uh, just kind of walk through what we talked about yesterday. So obviously we've been going through the book of Daniel and it's the last three chapters that we're looking at. And I think these are important chapters. I think they have some, some significant value for us, especially when we think about things like apocalyptic literature or, or end times type of conversations. And a lot of times this passage comes up when people talk about those things. And so let me kind of dig in. We're going to start in Daniel chapter 10. And uh, I just want to read a few verses that just kind of get us into uh, where we're at. So Daniel chapter 10, starting in verse 2, it says this. In those days, I, Daniel, was mourning for three full weeks. I didn't eat any rich food. No meat or wine entered my mouth. And I didn't put any oil on my body until the three weeks were over. On the 24th day of the first month, as I was standing on the bank of the Tigris, uh, on the great river, the Tigris, I looked up and there was a man dressed in linen with a belt of gold of Euphaz around his waist. His body was like beryl and his face like the brilliance of lightning, his eyes like flaming torches, his arms and feet like gleam, uh, feet like the gleam of polished bronze. And on the, and the sound of his words were like the sound of a multitude. Only I, Daniel, saw the vision. The men who were with me did not see it, but a great terror fell on them, and they ran and hid. I was left alone looking at this great vision. No strength was left in me. My face grew deathly pale, and I was powerless. I heard the words he said, and when I heard them, I fell into a deep sleep with my face on the ground. Now, over the last month and a half, we've been going through the book of Daniel, and we've been hearing all kinds of uh, different uh, stories, different things maybe that we've taught and been taught. If we grew up in church, we've heard the stories of Daniel in the lion's den and the three men thrown into the furnace and stuff like that. But, but in each chapter that we've looked at throughout the whole book of Daniel, there's a common theme, stay faithful, stay faithful. We see it in the story of, uh, as the story begins with these four young men who are pulled from their families as teenagers and brought to this foreign land and, 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 uh, and encouraged to do things that violated the commitment that they had made to God in terms of what they ate and drank. And, and they stood firm. They, they stayed faithful. And, and, and God did amazing things through that. <clears throat> Next, we hear the story. We, we see that these th three of the young men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they are, uh, they, they are challenged to compromise whether they really do uh, worship God or not. And so they're, they're, they're thrown into this situation where if they don't bow down and worship this idol, they're going to be thrown into first, and yet they stay faithful. We see the story of Daniel when he is challenged in, in his act of praying um, and, and told not that he can't pray anymore. And yet he stays faithful, and he's thrown into a den of lions. We see uh, the story of, of Nebuchadnezzar, oh, that these men's faithfulness, uh, by, by the time it's the end of Nebuchadnezzar's career um, as a king, <clears throat> and, and, he's, and he's nearing the end, he, he realizes who God is. Some great stories, and time and time again, we see this whole idea of faithfulness, stay faithful. Then when we hit the visions of Daniel in Daniel 7 through 12, he's got three visions. And in the first one, we see what the whole book is about. It's, it, in this first vision, Daniel's told that God is going to send a Savior. He's going to send someone that will save all people, whether they're Jew or Gentile. Uh, an incredible part, but, but all of it has been focused on that. And so now, as we begin to look at these other visions, uh, last week we, we looked at the second vision. All of them, all three of them, are still pointing back to that one truth, that God is going to send a Savior. So stay faithful. And, and so uh, it's really easy to get all caught up in all the apocalyptic type of stuff. Apocalypse basically means an unwrapping or an unveiling. And, and the whole premise of what happens in the end is God unwraps what sin has messed up. Uh, God unveils who the real God, who the real Savior of the world is. Uh, and that's obviously for us that know uh, because we've been around church enough and we've heard the message of the gospel. It's Jesus. But, but, but here's the thing. We can get all wrapped up in that. But, but the whole principle is to stay faithful. Even if God doesn't handle, even if the, the, the phrase of the three young men, even if God doesn't do things the way we want him to do it, 
that we hope he would do it. Even if we're thrown into this furnace, we're going to stay faithful. And that's the message. So that brings us to this third vision of Daniel. And it's one of the most apocalyptic ones, one of the, one of the key ones that a lot of people that get into the eschatology and end time stuff, they end up uh, using this passage and it gets dissected and, and picked apart and, and, and there's all kinds of angles. But if we lose sight, listen, if we lose sight, of the true gospel, if we lose sight of what Daniel's talking about, that there's going to be a Savior who is going to change everything. If we lose sight of that, we will get wrapped up into all of the, the, the views of whatever happens at the end of time. Um, in fact, this passage, churches have split over it. Uh, pastors have been fired from their positions. Uh, even theologians who are best friends have turned against each other because they took a different view. And, and I think it's sad that that happens, but, but there's a lot to unpack here. And so instead of going through all three chapters, kind of want to just give a summary of, of what takes place. And then I want to kind of zero in on two key verses that were incredibly encouraging for, for Daniel, but they are huge for us today. And so let me kind of dig into the story a little bit. And, and as we kind of think about it, understand what Daniel's going through uh, because he's had these up and down times. He has these really good moments and these really difficult moments. And we know how that is, right? Uh, we, we know that there are going to be tough times, that, that there's going to be very difficult times uh, that, that we would not wish to go through. Uh, there's going to be times when nothing seems to be going right. There's going to be times when it seems easier just to give up and uh, maybe quit a job or, or walk away from a relationship uh, we, we often turn to things that we self-medicate with or we just wallow in our own sorrow, right? And, and, and so we know that there's going to be those kind of times, but we also know there's going to be amazing times, these, these moments when, when we can't believe what we are witnessing, when, when we laugh so hard that we cry, uh, when, we, when we see God show up and he seems to calm the storm, and, and then we're just left there in awe and wonder of who he is. And, and I think that's the reality of the book of Daniel. Um, and, and I was thinking about, you know, well, how does this relate to me? And, and I was thinking about all the times that we took uh, our, our kids camping. And, and I was trying to think of a, a specific time. And, and my daughter Naomi was here this week uh, for her birthday. And so we were talking about it. And she, she brought up the, the time that we were camping and it was late at night. It was, you know, around 9, 30, 10 o'clock. And where we go camping, it, it's in the woods. It, we're not around anybody for a couple miles. We don't have cell phone service. We don't have any kind of uh, connection. Uh, <clears throat> it's just us. Excuse me. And so we are, um, we're in the middle of the woods and we pitch a tent. Uh, we're not staying anything nice. It's just a tent on the floor. Or, or on on cots and um, so it was late at night and and Abby and Jail and Naomi all go into uh, to the place about 7,500 yards away from us where the bathroom was uh, where we dug a hole and that's where we did it um, so they go off to do that it's dark they go off with a flashlight toilet paper and whatnot and they go into uh, there and and Lori and Rachel and I are kind of getting the the, the tent all set up inside, and all of a sudden, we hear this blood-curdling scream. And of course, as parents, we're freaked out. We, we don't know what's happening. We're like, what's happening to our kids? And so horror comes over us as we're trying to get out of the, the, the tent fast enough and trying to unzip the, the opening, and, and finally we get out and we see, bounding through the woods, this flashlight, and it's just one flashlight coming through the woods, and here comes Naomi dragging Abby with her out of the woods, and we're like, what's going on? Where's JL? What, what are you doing? She goes, uh, she's back there. She's, she was going to the bathroom, but uh, we had to run away. I was like, what, what, what do you mean you had to run away? And, and Naomi just looks at me and goes, I, I saw eyes. And, and we're like, well, you left your sister back in the thing. And so we go back and there's JL just kind of trying to walk back in the dark, make her way back and crying because she's been left behind. And, and it's, just a, it's a funny moment that in the moment it was scary for us, uh, but, but shortly after that, even today, we, we still laugh about it. And I think that's kind of how life is. There's these moments that are so great uh, that, that you just laugh about them, and some moments are so terrible. And sometimes, sometimes those moments are just terrible in the moment, but when you look back, you can laugh about it. And that's Daniel. That Daniel has these moments where it's, God is amazing and he can't help but just bring a, bring a big smile to his face like, 
man, God is amazing. And then these other moments where he's just like, man, life is not going to be good. And that's the message that Daniel's hearing. It begins, Daniel 10 begins with Daniel in mourning. He's, he's, he's upset. He's concerned because here's what's happened. Uh, the, the people of Israel have been allowed to go back to Israel and, and rebuild the temple. And it'll be the first time in 50 years that they get to celebrate the Passover together at the new temple. It, it's, it hasn't happened in 50 years. And Daniel's been waiting for this day, but he's too old to go back. And so he has to stay. And so part of him is mourning because he doesn't get to participate in it. But he also looks around at his people. And not everyone has gone back. In fact, uh, many of the people that he hoped would go back, and he was hoping that all of them would go back, but the people uh, that didn't go back, some of the younger people, some of the younger families, uh, they don't want to go back. They, they like their lifestyle in Babylon. They, they, they don't mind worshiping the gods that Babylon worshiped. It, it'd be like a parent who, who has tried to raise their kids in church and then it comes to the time when their kids leave home and go off to college and they never return to church. It's that feeling of, I just want my kids to understand how, how big of a deal God is. And they've forgotten who God is. And that's what's on Daniel's heart as he's, as he's uh, upset. And, and then all of a sudden there's this vision where, where the son, that, where this, this man shows up. And, and he uses the phrase man. He's seen an angel before. He's talked to Gabriel. And so he's experienced angelic beings before. But this isn't an angel. This is something different. And he describes him, it looks like a man, but it, but it wasn't, but it was. And, and in fact, the same uh, description is given by John in the book of Revelation at the very beginning, where, where he has a similar end times type of vision. And, and so they both describe this man of wearing white linen with a gold sash or belt around them that he had eyes like fire, that, that he had a face like lightning. If you've ever uh, been really close to lightning striking, uh, you know how the hair raises on the back of your head. I don't need the jokes. Uh, but he, you know, the hair raises on the back of your head and, and, you're, and, and you're just, it, it, and I felt it. It, it. I had one hit uh, probably about 200, 300 yards from me once. And it just one, it was so loud and so much that it just brought me to my knees. That's what Daniel and John experienced. They, they see this, this man, and, and, and when he speaks, his voice is like a multitude, like a gym full of people screaming or yelling, just this loud roar. It's, it's like roaring waters that you can't even think over, and they're experiencing this. And, and so I, I, I wonder, you know, like, who's this man that he's talking to? And it's interesting that both Daniel and John describe him the same way. Uh, it's, it's, it's also uh, similar to the description that Paul, when he was Saul on his road to Damascus, it's a similar situation where he's walking with these people to Damascus. He's got some men with him, and he's going to go persecute the Christians. And then he's confronted by Jesus on the road. And, and he falls to his face, uh, just like Daniel, just like John. And, and the men that are around him don't see who it is, and they take off running, just like Daniel's friends, just like my two daughters, Naomi and Abby. Um, and so there's this part, we see that we see Ezekiel describe this individual as, as an individual that, that was, he, he called him the glory of God, in, in my opinion. And, and there are scholars who, who uh, I've kind of... Uh, followed up with or you know kind of read read some of their stuff and and they would agree that there's there is a belief that this could have been Jesus regardless this individual is is so intense and so authoritative and so holy that Daniel is brought to his knees and then the man describe begins to describe what is going to happen and he uses the word in in verse 10 of chapter 10 he uses the word conflict and what's interesting about that word is that it's often associated with armies or hosts or, or angels, uh, spiritual battles. So it's at, at the same time, it's physical conflict. It's also spiritual conflict at the same time. And so what Daniel's doing or what, what this man is telling Daniel is that this isn't just about a physical thing that's going to happen. This is also a spiritual battle that is happening and will continue to happen until the end. And so following that is a description of these different leaders and different individuals in different times and periods uh, that would include many uh, people that would follow Daniel. And, and then it gets into Daniel chapter 11. 
And Daniel chapter 11 and chapter 12 are the, a continuation of this vision. And, and it begins describing this person uh, that as we look back on history, we, we know it to be a man by the name of Antiochus. And, and, but if you understand Jewish literature, it not only can refer to one thing, but a, can, uh, one person, but there could be a mirror of that other person. Uh, and so it, it's a kind of this back and forth of Ant Antiochus and a person that has not ruled yet called Antichrist. And, and so there's this back and forth uh, in this vision that kind of brings it all out. And, and again, this is something that has happened in the past. And for Daniel, it was going to happen in the future, but it could happen again. And, and so he's trying to put it, all these pieces together. And in the middle of all of this conflict and all of this terror, the world falling apart, the people who have tried to stay faithful are trying to stay faithful to God. And, and they're being persecuted in the middle of all of that is this incredible little nugget, these two little verses that I want to read to you. And, and I think these are important for us. Daniel chapter 11. Verse 32, at the very end of that verse, into the first part of uh, verse 33, it says, But the people who know their God will be strong and take action. Those who have insight among the people will give understanding to the many or to many. I, this, is, this is an incredible promise from God. That, that his people will be able to speak truth, that they will be able to uh, withstand with courage and, and, and fortitude those moments that are, that are just difficult and that there'll be this supernatural empowerment that, that will help them help other people realize who God is. Um, we see Jesus talk about things like this when he talks about that, that, that uh, that the disciples are going to go out and they're going to have be empowered by the Holy Spirit to do these things. And then when he talks about end time stuff or when he talks about these, these moments, he says there's going to be a time when we're going to be able to see who the faithful are as opposed to those who aren't faithful. We're going to see uh, God's going to separate the sheep from the goats. He's going to separate the wheat from the tares. And, 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 and so we'll, what we see is that, that God is telling Daniel that, that God there'll be a, this time when God separates the faithful from the pretenders. So the big question for us today is, and for you and, and even me, is do, do we really know God? Do we know God? Because it says, those who know God, though the people who know their God will be strong and they will take action. It is, is knowing God your heart's passion? Is knowing who Jesus is your passion? Do you, are, you, are you seeing moments when you are taking action? Now's the time to take action because we don't know when this new moment, when Jesus returns, is going to happen. And Jesus talks about that return often. It's not just, it's not that Daniel's just being told about this time leading up to Jesus coming on the scene, uh, you know, 500 years later. It's, this, is, this, is, this is big. In fact, Jesus talks about what Daniel says, and he talks about it like it's going to happen again. He talks about it in a way as he quotes Daniel, and he quotes Zechariah, Thessalonians, Revelation. Uh, or he doesn't quote Revelation. He quotes Zechariah and Daniel, uh, and what we see in Thessalonians Revelation, that, that Jesus has promised to return, and there's going to be a, a return of Jesus at some point. But Jesus says, his disciples say, well, when is the end going to happen? He says, no one knows the day or the hour. Not even me. Only my father knows. It's interesting. Sometimes we get so wrapped up in trying to figure out uh, the trueness of uh, end time stuff. Well, how is it really all going to happen? And can we see the signs? And, and, and the signs of the times are happening all around us. But, but, but Jesus says that's not important. What, what is important is do you know him? Do you know who Jesus is? Uh, it says that he will come like a thief in the night. And see, Jesus was constantly trying to warn his disciples that they don't know when their last breath is going to be. They don't know when he's going to return, when none of us do, and that we all need to be ready. And, and so as Jesus is quoting Daniel and talking about that to his disciples, he's, he's trying to convey this urgency that we should all have, uh, that, that in light of his return, our lives should look different. We, we, we should be radically, we, we should have a radically different look, outlook on life and what matters. Jesus is coming back, and our mission should be the same as Daniel's. And what's interesting, at the end of this vision, God, or this, this, this man, 
tells Daniel, gives him some final words. And it's at the very end of chapter 12. He says it a couple different times, but in verse 13, he repeats it. And he says this in verse 13. But as for you, go on your way to the end. Then you will rest. Go on your way to the end. Keep serving God. Keep, keep staying faithful all the way to the end. Be who God has called you to be. Stay faithful, even if it's not the way you hoped. It's interesting. Jesus says the same thing to the disciples in Matthew chapter 24. He's talking about uh, that there's going to be a time when they are going to be persecuted beyond anything they've ever experienced before. That things are not going to get better. They're going to get worse for the disciples. And, and then he talks about how this is all going to come about. And he says this in Matthew chapter four, or 24, starting in verse 13. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? And he goes on in verse 14. This good news of the kingdom will be proclaimed in all the world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. So when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel standing in the holy place, let the reader understand. What, what's incredible about this is he's referring to something that Daniel has told about, he's, which Anti, Antiochus does uh, years later. But, but he's also talking about like it's still going to happen again. And he goes on, and he says in verse 21, <clears throat> For at, the time, at that time there will be great distress, the kind that hasn't taken place from the beginning of the world until now, and never will again. So it's going to be awful. It's going to be difficult. It's going to be terrible. But look down at verse 29. He continues, Immediately after the distress of those days, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not shed its light, the stars will fall from the sky, and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky, and then all the peoples of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send out his angels with a loud trumpet, and they will gather his elect from the four winds from one end of the sky to the other. There's, there's that separation. It's, it's God is bringing people back together. He's bringing the people that have stayed faithful to him. But, but this return is different. His first return, he was coming as a savior. But when Jesus returns this time, he's not coming as a savior. He's coming as a judge. And he will begin to unwrap everything that sin has messed up. He'll begin, he, he will separate those who have stayed faithful from those who have just pretended to be faithful. And so the question is, will, will I be one of the ones who is found to be faithful, who is staying faithful and serving the kingdom, trying to point people to the gospel as often as I can? Or will I be one of those ones that Jesus talks about who are still gossiping about people and abusing people in relationships, uh, drinking with the drunkards and all that other kind of language, uh, living up, living my best life now and not worried about who God is and, and acting like he's never going to return. There is no God. That's the question that we have to wrestle with. That's what eschatology, that's what, and that's the study of end times, that's what uh, apocalyptic literature should do. It should cause us to question, am I being faithful? Stay faithful. Stay faithful to the end, just like Daniel. <clears throat> You'll rest when you die. All right. And, and so the, the big idea here that, that, that I think we need to kind of catch on to is that nothing matters more than the gospel. Because the, thing we, the things we think matter today won't matter anymore when he returns. And so we need, to, we need to elevate the true reality of the gospel. So how do we do that? Well, let me give you five quick things that, that you can do to make the most of the gospel. And, and honestly, these are things that, as, as I was working through this, I realized that I struggle with some of these. I, I have a hard time uh, staying faithful in these things, but, but I'm constantly brought back to how do I do this? How do I practice this? How do I, how do I stay faithful to the gospel and, and make the most of it? The first one is, is very clear. I think we need to be broken by sin. But we need to be broken by our sin for sure. And, and we need to confess when we sin and when we do wrong. It, it, man, if you're not being broken by your own sin, there might be a problem in, inside. But I think we also need to be broken by other people's sin. I think when we see other people in sin, we've become so desensitized to the world around us to when people do things that we know is wrong, that we know is against what God has formed. 
uh, I think sometimes we just kind of blow it off and, and just say, yeah, it's not that big of a deal. But the reality is it is. It's breaking the heart of God. It's, it's destroying that relationship that they could have with God. It's, it's separating them from God, and it could be an eternal decision uh, that, that, that they continue to make uh, where they are separated from God for eternity. And so I think the greatest danger of any professing Christian is when we become unmoved by sin. I, I, we, need to be, we need to be moved. We need to be convicted. We need to be broken by the sin that we see around us. Second, I think we need to be aware of the future. Um, if, if, if you knew that where you lived right now was not your home, right? You were not going to be there forever. In fact, a year from now, you're going to be, you were invited to come to an exclusive island where you got everything you could ever dream of. And, and your life was everything it could ever be. And, and, and there was no more worries, no more chaos, no more weird stuff happening in the world. It was just you on this island with the people that you care about the most. And, and you knew you were going to go there in a year. And, and one of the benefits of this island is that there's a specific bank on that island. And, on that, and at that bank, if you, every de, uh, dollar that you deposit today for, from here for the next year, they will double it. Wouldn't you begin giving every dollar you didn't need to live on? You, you just kept the, the little bit that you need to live on. And you, wouldn't you give as much as you could to that bank so that you could have even more freedom and comfort in the future? How much more important is the gospel than, than some exclusive island? You see, I, I think the, the concept of, of all these things, like being aware of the future, is, is we need to know that Jesus is going to return. We need to understand what apocalyptic eschatology type of stuff uh, could, could take place, but, but it needs to uh, work in us a, a spiritual sensitivity. And, and I think sometimes that spiritual sensi sensitivity only comes from a jolt that comes through apocalyptic type of literature, uh, things about end times. I'm not talking about zombie stuff. I'm talking about Bible type stuff that Jesus is going to return and, and things are going to get better, but man, they, they're going to get worse before they get better. I think the third thing is this, find comfort in Jesus. Uh, find comfort in Jesus. He, he, is, he, he assures us that he loves us and, and, he's, and he's shown that time and time again. He hears our prayers he promises his presence. He, he is that good shepherd that is with us in the valley of the shadow of death. And, and think about this. He is constantly advocating for you. He is standing before God and, and on your side, and he's saying, no, that one's mine. He, he she, they, yes, they, they have their faults, and yeah, they're not perfect, but I love them, and they have asked me for forgiveness, and I died for that sin, and I died for that sin, and I died for that sin. I think the fourth thing is this, find confidence in the Holy Spirit. First uh, John chapter 4, verse 4 says, You are from God, little children. You've been adopted by God. And you have conquered them. You have conquered all these moments. He talks about Antichrist in the verses before. Because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. God has given us, Jesus has sent his Holy Spirit to, to be in us, to change us, to help us speak when we need to say the right thing, when we need to step up. And so sometimes I, you, we, we have this excuse that we're not sure what we, want to, what we would say. Uh, that's the point. Uh, rely on the Holy Spirit to help you say what you need to say. Uh, I think sometimes we, we worry if, if a, an individual's heart or, or my heart is not broken enough, the Spirit will open hearts when, when he's ready. And when, it's, and when it's the right time. We need to find confidence in the Holy Spirit. And finally, the last thing is remember, rest is coming. Rest is coming. I, I, think, I think that's a, a thing that we need to grab onto that I, I'm not saying that we never get any rest or we never sleep or we never get a break, but, but the real true rest is coming when Jesus returns or when we die. Uh, so up until that point, stay faithful. Stay faithful to what God has called you to be. Uh, stay faithful to what he's called you to do. I think the basic purpose of most apocalyptic literature like we've read is really to uh, get the reader or the hearer to um, 
and I know this is cheesy, but but I really couldn't come up with a good way of saying it, but it is, is to give us chu, C-H-U, to give us courage, to give us courage when when everything seems to be going wrong, to give us courage in those fiery furnace moments, when we're standing before a fiery furnace moment where we've we've tried to stay faithful, and yet we feel like everything's going to be burned and destroyed. I, give us courage when when our faithfulness to God and, and staying connected to God uh, is is treated negatively and, and we have a moment when it feels like we're gonna be thrown to the lions. I think I think that kind of literature is, is for courage. I think it's also to give us a hope, to, to help us know that God wins in the end, that Jesus wins in the end, that he is the king, that he is going to win out and and he is going to be on our side and he is going to be fighting for us and that we just get to be along for the ride and watch him do amazing things and so it's to give us hope but i think also this last one the letter u is to give us urgency uh give us an urgency that we can't wait to see jesus that we can't wait to see what he's going to do, that we can't wait for our friends to experience the amazingness of Jesus, that we can't wait for our family to, to grab onto the hope and the courage and the urgency that, that Christ gives us and knowing him gives us. You see, we, we can't wait to decide to follow Jesus when we see Jesus. Uh, that's, that's not how it's going to work. I think there needs to be an urgency that we point people to the hope of the gospel uh, because there's going to be a time when they're going to have to stand before Jesus. And when we stand before him, he will either be our savior or our judge. So, who do you know that needs to know how amazing Jesus is? Maybe something's pricked in your heart that you haven't made that commitment to follow Christ. And something's stirring in you. And if you need to have some conversations, get with, uh, get with me or get with somebody uh, that goes to church regularly and talk about, ask them some questions. What does it mean to follow Jesus? What does it mean to stay faithful? What does that look like? And have that conversation. But, but maybe what's, what's kind of pricked in your heart is somebody that you know. God's put people in your life on purpose for a purpose. And so who do you know that needs to know the hope and, and, and the, the, the love of Jesus? Maybe maybe it's time to invite them to church. Uh, we've got our, our Palm Sunday and Easter services, uh, great opportunities. In fact, uh, studies show that most people attend church for the first time on one of those two Sundays, either Palm Sunday or Easter. Uh, and, and it's the most effective for people to invite people. The, the more people come when, because they're invited on those Sundays. And so maybe, maybe you want to invite them to church, invite them to uh, our, our Palm Sunday service or, or Easter service or wherever you're at. <clears throat> right. I think there's also a thing that we can uh, share what we believe and why we believe it. Look for those opportunities. Look for those opportunities when people are just waiting to hear the gospel and and uh, share that. Share why you believe what you believe without fear, with courage, knowing that the Holy Spirit is going to speak through you and, and could use you to change somebody's heart. You see, the Spirit's going to give you the words and, and God will hear your prayer. So stay faithful to the end, no matter what. All right, that's it. Hope, uh, hope that was helpful. And uh, I know that's a little weird, uh, but we will see you this upcoming Sunday uh, uh, with Palm Sunday. We've got a couple really cool messages uh, that, that we are uh, putting together for, for those services. So we can't wait to you're here. Uh, join us then. See ya. Bye.